At number 10, we have Quake. Quake is originally a member of S.H.I.E.L.D. and is a decent hero himself, but he doesn't bring much to the table for the Avengers. One of her most notable contributions to the team is helping them take down the Phoenix Force, which is sort of a team effort more than anything. And her biggest task even in that battle is when she interrogates the X-Men. The main issue is that often Daisy Johnson aka Quake is better as a spy and a police agent than as a hero. She does have powers, but she spends more time interrogating people and doing more traditional police work than high level superhero work. Something that also seems a little counterproductive is that she is announced to the public as being part of the Avengers, sort of killing her anonymity as a special agent. This leaves her with a target on her back as a covert spy and without her spy work, she doesn't really have the power set to really keep up with the other members of the Avengers. Although let's be honest, the standards for the Avengers are pretty high and if you can find a way to stand out you're lucky. Quake had a way to stand out as the covert spy on the team, but this was cut short by this announcement by Captain America. Even if I'm over exaggerating the significance of that event though, she still just doesn't make a huge impact on the team, even as an undercover agent. At number 9 is Quasar. This hero is sort of like the Marvel equivalent to DC's Green Lantern, to the point where many people see him as a blatant ripoff. Starting off as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, Wendell Elvis Vaughn comes across a set of power bands which he uses to gain superpowers and become designated as the protector of the universe. Where this character falls flat is simply in the way that he seems to waste his potential. His powers allow him to traverse the cosmos and extend the bandwidth of the Avengers into an intergalactic context. Although Thor does that a little bit, he could definitely have helped. But he doesn't really take advantage of these supreme abilities as much as he could. I mean, he's the protector of the universe. You'd think that his story would break some more ground and offer the Avengers a more exciting addition to their already enormous bandwidth of power, but he doesn't. These days, the Guardians of the Galaxy seem to be filling the Avengers quotas for cosmic exploration and protection, which leaves Quasar feeling a little irrelevant. Maybe not a bad hero on his own, but he's criminally underdeveloped and a little bland considering the extent of his powers. At number eight is Mantis. Mantis is also very powerful, but she doesn't really do much for the Avengers while she's part of the team. After officially joining the West Coast Avengers, she helps them take down Voice, which is basically the extent of her work with them before that version of her is killed. And what seems to be a theme with Mantis is getting other teams of superheroes to help her complete her own personal quests, like the time when she gets the West Coast Avengers to help get to the bottom of her issues during the Fragmented Mind storyline, or another time when she gets the Fantastic Four to help her figure out some other personal issues. She does some pretty heavy lifting in the Thanos War storyline, actually facing him one on one, ending up in a tie, but she's not officially an Avenger at that point. She also seems to stir up a lot of drama within the Avengers, getting caught in a bit of a love triangle with Swordsman and Vision. She's definitely not the worst of the Avengers, but she doesn't do much to help them during her short time with a membership. Besides, it's the West Coast Avengers. They're not really the most powerful or impactful iteration of the team either way. Don't kill me in the comments if you disagree, it's just what I'm gauging from the online conversation. At number 7 we have Ex Nihilo and Abyss. This pair of strange aliens actually join the Avengers at one point and it's a really strange addition to the team to say the least. Since they join at the same time during the Infinity storyline, I figured I'd put them in the same entry here. These two aliens have so much power that where they really fail to make an impact is by not exploring these powers very much. This seems to be a theme in this second part, just heroes who have tons of power that they're never given the chance to use for whatever reasons. It also seems that these two extraterrestrials have their own cosmic destinies already planned out for them, and neither have much to do with the Avengers or any of their goals. My best guess is that writers included them in a moment when it made sense, but then after a while realized that they were too overpowered or not grounded enough as characters to serve the Avengers properly. Because looking back on them now, it's pretty apparent to fans online that they were never really fitting for the Avengers in the first place. At number 6 we have Red Hulk. Another sort of pointless copy of an already established Avenger, Red Hulk just doesn't bring anything new to the table when he joins, and his attitude is just sort of unlikable at times. I know the Hulk isn't really known for his attitude either, but there's something about General Thaddeus Ross that doesn't really sit right. He's sort of like a stuck up army general who doesn't know how to turn off his 
critical edge and be a team player. Well, actually, it's not sort of like that. He's just like that. That's what. He, that's exactly what he is. Although, when he turns into the Hulk, he does keep his rational thinking mind, which gives him a slight edge over the Hulk, who basically has a one-track mind to destroy everything in his path. But as good as this sounds, it sort of acts as a lesson to the Avengers, in that even though the Hulk can be a lot at times, having a rational tactical mind inside the beast can also cause problems. Because in the case of General Thaddeus Ross, his tactical mind isn't the most cooperative or friendly when getting things done. And he just seems to put everyone off with his approach to collaboration. But he's still pretty strong, so we can't get too carried away here. After all, attitude isn't the only thing that should be considered when ranking the Avengers. But even then, when looking at his abilities, he's not much of a standout member of the team either. No matter which way you look at it, he's still just a different colored Hulk. They've already got a green one. At number five is Rage. This guy holds the accolade of being the youngest to ever join the Avengers, but not much else. And this wasn't by design. Rage's powers were acquired by an exposure to toxic waste, which actually gives him the body of a full grown man. Even though he's only 13 in reality. So when he joins the Avengers, he does it under false pretenses, fooling even Captain America into thinking he is a suitable age for the team. And even though they do give Spider-Man a membership to the team, he's always been known as an exception to this no teenagers rule. The protocol is typically to keep the team consisting of physically and mentally mature heroes who can handle extremely high stakes situations without issue. And unfortunately, Rage's failure to do that is what makes him one of the worst Avengers. He just shows a pretty immature disposition and it sort of overshadows his abilities as a hero. And failing to hide this immaturity, he also finds himself on the outs of the Avengers a bit earlier than he may have hoped. Not in the most gracious fashion either. Captain America basically catches on and fires him off the team once he realizes that Somewhere deep down, he's just a mere middle schooler. At number four, we have Death Cry. This character has a very short run with the Avengers and doesn't really make a mark on the team in any significant way. What puts her so high on the list is that she actually forces her way onto the Avengers in a way that infuriates the other team members. Although part of me thinks this makes sense since she's a Shi'ar warrior who is actually commanded by the Empress to protect and ultimately join the Avengers. The only misstep here is that this isn't really her call to make. At least the part where she joins them, for two reasons. Firstly, because she too is a teenager and that's a no-no for the Avengers, as discussed before. And secondly, because it's one thing to try and protect the Avengers, but getting an official membership takes a bit more than some altruistic bodyguarding. When she's first rejected by the team, she stays persistent and eventually sort of forces her way onto the team instead. But this doesn't last long as she's incinerated by Captain Universe, who doesn't even really mean to kill her in the first place. It's sort of her fault, realistically. She comes at him in one of her trademark berserker rages just because he takes a kill that she wanted for herself. So in self-defense, he raises a big ball of energy and she kind of just flies into it and just explodes. Not the most gracious ending to an Avengers member, capping off an equally ungracious lifespan. At number three is Thunderstrike, another knockoff character, except this guy is a knockoff of Thor, who just doesn't find his footing with the Avengers. This is probably because of how similar he is to the already extremely popular hero when he's introduced in the late 80s. But this isn't a coincidence. Eric Masterson, aka Thunderstrike, first appears in Thor 391 and actually has a quick run as Thor before he's demoted to Thunderstrike. And even though he still remains relatively powerful, his influence just plateaus as soon as he's left to exist in the shadow of the much more popular Thor. And not to mention, his costume, it's just pretty weak. He looks like an aging biker who only shops at thrift stores. It might just be the case that Thunderstrike is meant to be a bit more of a relatable version of Thor that people could see themselves in, but after he joins the Avengers, it proves that he really has no distinct qualities that set him apart from the rest of the team. No offense to him though. It's tough when you're a carbon copy of the God of Thunder just with a worse outfit. Might just be bad luck or bad writing. More likely the second one. At number two is Gilgamesh, or the Forgotten One, and the second name is fitting because he really just doesn't do anything of substance for the team. He joins in issue number 300 of Avengers when the team is in the process of reforming. So 
I'm going to chalk this up to a misstep in the writing process. My theory is that the writers thought that Gilgamesh would be a little bit more popular than he turns out to be. Although I don't know how that would be possible as well considering his costume which just like the previous entry it's just it's quite understandably known as one of the more boring and downright ugly costumes out of anyone on the Avengers. But besides that his attitude is also known to be pretty arrogant and a little too proud. For instance, he often refers to himself as being in the higher ranks of the Ageless Eternals. And although he is immortal, you don't really go around pimping yourself like that. He has a lot of potential as a superhero for the team, but that's all the more reason that Avengers fans have been disappointed in his weak and somewhat unlikable influence on the team. Finally, at number one, we have Triathlon, aka 3D Man. I was sad to have to do 3D Man dirty and put him at number one because I actually love this character, mainly because of how silly it is that he's based on the color palette of a pair of early 2000s 3D sunglasses, and how even sillier it is that his powers really have nothing to do with 3D anything. All these setbacks are the reason why I love this character, but I knew he had to make it onto the list if we made a part two, so here he is. And apparently a lot of people online agree that he's one of the all-time worst Avengers, so there is no better spot to honor him than at number one. Originally joining the Secret Avengers, Captain America makes 3D Man a member of the Initiative and puts him on the Hawaii team, which is self-explanatory. It's basically a team in charge of keeping watch over issues that take place in and around the state of Hawaii. And no diss to Hawaii, but there isn't much that goes on over there in the Marvel Universe, at least during 3D Man's run. One of his more notable acts as an Avenger is when he captures Scarlet Witch during the Axis storyline and brings her to a machine, Doctor Doom, in an effort to take her abilities. But he sort of drops the ball in this moment of glory and she escapes. Look, 3D Man isn't that bad. He's just a weird superhero that just doesn't really make much sense and the banality of his abilities sort of equate to his lack of usefulness as an Avenger at the end of the day. What can I say? Number 10, Civil War 1. Oh boy, the first Civil War caused a great uproar and a good deal of problems in the superhero community. It also made Earth vulnerable to attack as it evidently involved just infighting. When superheroes turn on each other, that's bad. When two main superheroes who are part of the same team turn on each other, that's ridiculous. And that's exactly what happened with Civil War 1. While the inciting incident that divided heroes wasn't caused by Iron Man or Captain America and actually was pretty serious, they both had become leaders of two different approaches for how to best resolve that main issue. Iron Man believed that superhuman beings needed a shorter and tighter leash basically and should work with the government so they could kind of be overseen. Number 9. Axis Axis was an event where we saw heroes and villains sort of do kind of like a role reversal. This happened as a result of a spell backfiring, cast by, well you probably guessed it, none other than Scarlet Witch. Wanda, for being a powerful magic user, has kind of a challenging time with magic. Although to be fair, she actually wasn't the only caster involved here, although she is the one that we often talk about. Doctor Strange started casting with her and when he got taken out, Doctor Doom actually helped in his stead. So Doom is also possibly to blame as well. Even though Wanda usually takes a lot of the flack for this one. What launched the Axis event was Wanda and Doom attempting to cast this spell on the evolved and supremely powerful version of Red Skull, Red Onslaught, which sort of came about when Magneto was like, I know how to fix this, I'll kill you, and then Red Onslaught happened, so it didn't work out so great. The spell actually succeeded, but kind of backfired in that many other heroes and villains within a certain radius also got hit with the spell unintentionally. Oops. And friends, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, may I recommend that you check out our latest channel, Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Number 8, Hydra Cap. Hydra Cap is definitely a pretty bad thing that happened for the Avengers in, well, in many regards. One, Hydra Captain America is literally another version of Captain America who for a while we actually thought was the main continuity version for real. So. We're not off to a great start with that. Number two, the Avengers failed to stop Hydra Supreme Cap from taking over the US. Number three, some of the Avengers were even manipulated into joining Hydra and Hydra Cap's forces. Some of them were actually like possessed and some of them were just kind of made to do so. All around, it was just a rough time and not a great look for the Avengers overall. I'm actually surprised there isn't more pushback from the public today as a result of this one. Number seven, killed Jean Grey. Wolverine has done this on multiple occasions and in one instance, 
kind of killed Jean on repeat, stuck on a loop of death after she refused to stay dead thanks to the resurrection powers of the Phoenix Force. Initially, Wolverine killed Jean out of mercy to save her from a gruesome death, burning up as they were in a space shuttle that was rapidly getting closer and closer to the sun. However, this death was actually quite helpful as it allowed Jean to at least regenerate, unlocking her full potential as the Phoenix, which meant that she could actually then save them. So, yay! And surprisingly, she also wasn't even mad about Wolverine killing her. Bonus. I'd be pretty mad to be honest. I'd be like, wow, you just, you were literally, you just killed me. That's pretty shady, man. But I guess when you're like, but you unlocked my full potential, it's like, well, all right. Shortly thereafter, Jean would be killed permanently by Magneto, but years later would return again, only to have Wolverine, afraid of the potential of Dark Phoenix, along with the rest of the X-Men, kill her on repeat for a while by stabbing her through with his claws until he realized this wasn't exactly having the same effect that he'd hoped as the Phoenix Forest basically just kept rising Jean. So, doesn't always work out. Still, that's a lot of Jean deaths. That is, I think at least nine Jean deaths total. I think eight stabbies the one time, one stabby the other time. A lot of deaths. A lot of deaths without any actual death. Actually, now that I think about it. Number six, final fight. When the Earth was threatened by incursions during the events of Time Runs Out, what did the Avengers do? Save the day? Try to stop those incursions? Not exactly. Captain America had once been a member of the Illuminati, the secret group of heroes who banded together to resolve ideally all of Earth's problems without anyone actually even knowing. A group of super powered, intellectual, philosophical, and moral geniuses. At least, that's what they thought. When the incursions were discovered to be a threat, and the majority of the group felt that it was important to consider the possibility that they'd maybe need to destroy other worlds to sort of save themselves from it, Captain America fought vehemently against that idea. As such, his mind was wiped and he was decidedly ejected from the group. When he regained his memories, rather than use the Avengers to fight against the incursions and find a way to stop them, he actually spent the last bit of time before the multiverse was to end hunting down the Illuminati and in a toe to toe battle with Iron Man. Number five, Robbie and Ellie. So this one's a little murky. Robbie Reyes is the current ghostwriter and he's great. He's super interesting. His car is hella cool. I just find him to be a smidge bit more evil than his other counterparts. And that's because when Robbie Reyes becomes ghostwriter, he is not a spirit of vengeance. Robbie is instead possessed by a ghost of a guy named Eli. Now it is revealed in all new ghostwriter number eight in 2014 that Eli was not a spirit of vengeance like John Blazes Zarathos, but instead, Eli is Robbie's uncle and a satanic serial delifer who took the lives of and dismembered at least 37 people in rituals before he was finally taken out by the police in 1999. And he lived in the house that the Reyes brothers, Gabe and Robbie, took to living in. So while Robbie himself isn't necessarily a bad dude, not entirely, the alter ego he now lives with is indeed quite evil, and they constantly have to do mental battle for Robbie to stay in control and not completely given to Eli's bloodlust. That's a no for me. I don't know. Number four, Civil War II. Even worse by far than Civil War I was its follow up, Civil War II. In this story, we got more infighting, but for less logical reasons. This time, it was Iron Man versus Captain Marvel, because I guess Iron Man just really needs to like duke it out with all the captains. This one is one we can also likely more blame on the behind the scenes, as Marvel was definitely aiming to capitalize on Civil War one success with this follow up, but it just didn't work out too well because Civil War 2 didn't really make a lot of sense for most readers. But in terms of the canon, Carol, I think, was hands down to blame here for just being, well, unreasonably aggressive on the matter that was up for debate. Whether or not to let Inhuman Ulysses, a precog, predict the future and then, based on those predictions, stop future criminals from committing future crimes before, of course, they even happen. Yeah, and I say that as a Captain Marvel fan. I'm a big Carol Danvers fan, but this. This one was pretty one-sided in my mind. Even I am like, I think Carol was wrong and Tony was right. And I don't say that very often. Number three, killed the mongrels. These last few spots are definitely all competitors for the number one spot on this list in my opinion. This one is especially bad because the mongrels were actually Wolverine's children, although he didn't know it at the time that he was forced to fight them. They were rounded up by his known son with Itsu, Dokken. Dokken was working with the Red Right Hand, a group who had a personal vendetta against Wolverine. Dokken created the team known as the Mongrels, not even really to defeat Wolverine, despite Dokken having trained them himself. It was kind of 
of like a win-win situation for him. Either Wolverine would be killed by the children he didn't know or had forgotten he'd sired over the years, or Wolverine would end up killing them all. The latter was kind of how it went down, and when Wolverine learned that the members of the mongrels had actually all been his children, and he didn't know that, he was pretty heartbroken. So I guess point one for Red Right Hand and Dawkins. Only sad points for Wolverine. No points for the mongrels, because they died. Number two, ignoring Scarlet Witch. Avengers Disassembled was bad, but likely what was worse was that it kind of could all have been avoided if the rest of the team had simply, I don't know, cared more about their teammate and friend, Wanda. Scarlet Witch had a lot happen to her, and although this is of course superhero comics where every day that you're alive there's a threat of trauma or, you know, of the world ending or both, there had been many signs that Wanda was not in a good place. Rather than do something about it or, you know, attempt to, I don't know, get her help, mainly the Avengers just went on as though everything was fine. I mean, I know they all each have a lot individually going on, but come on guys. If you have someone with reality warping powers on your team and they are using those powers to create fake children, which then disappear without a trace after they also lose their life partner thanks to them basically being taken apart, mind wiped, and rebuilt as a blank slate without emotion, you might think to offer them some help or, you know, at least check in to see like if they need anything, if they need a hug or a a conversation. I'm not blaming them for what Wanda did, but I would at least like to hold them accountable for being pretty much awful friends to her in her time of need. Number one, no more mutants. Probably one of the worst things that at least one of the Avengers did was to threaten all of the mutant kind's existence with just, you know, a few words. Although admittedly, this wasn't so much Wanda's fault as it was Marvel's, who of course needed some reason to get rid of mutants for a bit because, you know, they'd sold the rights away and they weren't really profiting as much from comics involving mutants at that time, and they simply had too many of them. But reasoning behind the story aside, during House of M, Wanda in the end struck out at all mutants because her father, she felt, was more obsessed with fighting for mutant rights than he was with his actual own flesh and blood family. Although we'd later learn that Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver weren't even really like flesh and blood family. To begin with, part of the reason that Wanda suffered the mental break, which caused House of M and later M Day, had to do with the fact that her friends and Avengers didn't seem to notice or perhaps care that Wanda was suffering as a result of losing her children. And in fact, let us not forget that Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, of the Avengers was also the one who even kind of like caused Wanda to remember her kids to begin with. She kind of spilled those beans. So whose fault was M Day really in the end? It was still Wanda's. Wanda was the one that said the words, so it's still her fault. But Janet was there. At number 10, we have Sandman. Although his redemption arc is really great and has so much potential, it sort of falls flat. Basically, the thing one day sits Sandman down and tries to turn him to the good side, and it works. With Sandman now finding his stride as a hero, he first joins the Outlaws, a team of reformed Spider-Man enemies, and is then given a membership to the Avengers. It's all going in the right direction for the former villain until he's promptly hypnotized by Wizard and turned back to the dark side. Honestly, this isn't even Sandman's fault, but his quick turn back to evil gets in the way of him being anything close to a functional member of the Avengers. I almost didn't even put him on the list just because he barely even does anything for the team after he's inducted. And even tragically after that, he even goes off to reform the Sinister Six right after leaving the Avengers Reserve, which basically erases any good he may have done during his time as an Avenger. At number nine, we have Justice, FKA Marvel Boy. Although he's known as a pretty well-respected hero, at least in his later years, Justice still doesn't do much for the Avengers during his time with them. When he first joins, he comes off as more of a fan than anything else, making some rookie mistakes right off the bat. He also finds a way to break his leg, which isn't very common for a superhero. Much of his lack of maturity in the group is due to his worship for the other members of the Avengers, so it's hard to blame him, although he does do some pretty good work in planning to take down Ultron. Later, he ends up teaching for the Avengers Academy alongside Hank Pym, Ty Tigra, Quicksilver, and Speedball. But overall, this character's time with the Avengers is wrought with scattered accomplishments and distracting love triangle storylines that just make him a much less effective member of the team. At number eight is Sentry, who joins the Mighty Avengers after having one foot in the door of the new Avengers for a while. This guy is a poor addition to the team simply based on issues of power imbalance and, unfortunately, his own mental health. On the power side of things, he's so powerful that he sort of drowns out the efforts of the Avengers as a team, which in many ways is a good problem to have. 
but on top of this, due to his mental health issues, he tends to have trouble reining in his power set and often second guesses himself. I feel badly for the Sentry and I only put him on this list because sometimes people just aren't right for a big team. When it becomes clear that Sentry is fighting some internal battles, he is still known as the most powerful member of the team, but just needs to figure himself out first. For example, at one point, Sentry attacks Ultron at a moment when the team needed him to hold back and sort of ruins the whole plan. Although the attack was in retaliation for Ultron seemingly killing his wife, so it's not that unexpected. It's just one of the many times that Sentry has troubles keeping his composure and taking on the responsibilities of an Avenger. He's not a bad hero, just maybe not right for the best superhero alliance ever created. At number seven, we have US Agent, or John Walker, formerly a stand-in for Captain America. His true colors show when Steve Rogers returns and Walker is renamed US Agent, which is just a bunko name if you ask me. I had to put him on the list even though he does the honorable deed of taking over as Captain America when Steve Rogers goes AWOL and becomes Nomad. He's just a little too intense on the patriotism front and brings the team down as a result. A huge part of Steve Rogers' influence on the Avengers is his ability to shelve the burden of America's unofficial, but basically official superhero, and keep his intentions focused on acting in favor of others. He's able to put aside his pride and work for the team, whereas Walker does the opposite. He does work for the team, but it's a big lesson in the importance of good attitude because they have the same powers, but something about John Walker's suffocating patriotism and inherent arrogance that comes with it just proves that no one could do the job like Steve could. And once again, US Agent is just such a lame name to take on, unrelated. Especially after having gone as Captain America for a time, it's just, maybe I just feel badly for him in a way. At number six, we have Swordsman. With the biggest accolade being that he trains Hawkeye, it's hard not to squeeze this guy onto the list. Basically, Swordsman starts off as a circus performer who is known for demonstrating his mastery with bladed weaponry. He was more of a showman than a superhero realistically and also more of a villain than a superhero, if we're being honest. After losing all his money due to his gambling addiction, he decides to steal from the carnival paymaster and when a young Hawkeye chases him, Swordsman almost kills his own apprentice. And then fast forwarding, the way that he's eventually admitted into the Avengers is basically through fraud. He teams up with Mandarin and sends a fake message posing as Iron Man to the Avengers to allow himself into the group and it works. Being a double agent for Mandarin, he later lures the Avengers into a bomb with the intention of blowing them up. Although he does try to dismantle it in a moment of regret, he's still dejected from the Avengers anyway. I think they just sensed he was screwing around with them. He then basically just falls back into a life of crime while picking up a drinking habit along the way which isn't part of the reason I put him on the list. This is kind of sad. He's a very troubled character and just had some nasty intentions and tendencies. Not the most noble of the Avengers by any means. At number five, we have Jack of Hearts. This guy is notoriously one of the worst Avengers because his most notable act as part of the team is murdering another one of the members. Although he does this while under the influence of Scarlet Witch, there's no hiding from something so brutal. I mean, the Avenger he kills is Ant-Man, who's a really important member of the team. Aside from this though, Jack of Hearts also just spends such a short time with the Avengers that even his heroic deeds are sort of weak, regardless of the tragedy. Being the 52nd member of the Avengers, he's brought on specifically to help take on Kang the Conqueror. They all team up with the Justice League and a huge battle goes down. And then promptly after this, Jack tragically decides he needs to end his own life for various reasons, taking a villain with him who had killed Ant-Man's daughter. But it's pretty ironic that the next time he makes an appearance, he blows himself up and takes Ant-Man with him. Just a messy run as an Avenger through and through. At number four, we have Stingray. This guy isn't ever really a true member of the Avengers. He is officially, but he only seems to jump on as part of the group when they need him, like when they need access to his underwater hydro base or when an inverted Doctor Doom brings him on to rescue civilians from a river. He's sort of their fringe friend that they use for water related issues. Could this be a case of lazy writing? Perhaps. But it seems more like he's not really a strong enough character to do much more than pop in and out of the scene when water gets involved. He also almost fights Iron Man due to a misunderstanding right when he joins the team and even campaigns to have him removed from the Avengers 
which is just an awful way to start. At number three is Star Fox. This guy is just a bad hero. He's not even really a hero. His powers are extremely problematic in that he can basically gain the love of a woman on command. But it's not really love because it's artificial and it only lasts for so long. So when he uses his powers, these women often wake up not knowing where they are or what they've done, which is naturally a pretty deplorable thing to inflict on a person with your powers. And he doesn't even seem to feel badly after it either. He just gets his clothes on and jumps out the window like, See you later. Good luck piecing together the last 12 hours. Otherwise known as Eros of Titan, this guy is actually Thanos' older brother, so this sort of explains the evil nature of his powers. At least in the comics, they're kind of aware of his nasty nature, because the woman who he's used his powers on eventually come out and sue him because of what he does, which has to be a first for a superhero. I'm honestly just surprised that this dude even had a membership to the Avengers in the first place. He just, just kind of sucks. At number two is D-Man or Demolition man. This dude should never really have been brought on to join the Avengers. He's sort of just this unmotivated, scraggly guy with a horribly designed suit. He just steals Wolverines and Daredevil's costumes and makes a tragic mashup of the two. His origins are that he's basically a wrestler that was given superhuman strength before befriending Captain America. When Cap needs to reform the Avengers, he thinks it's a good idea to bring on D-Man to join the team. But this choice is pretty obviously out of sympathy for the guy because he doesn't really do much when he does join. He's then sort of left behind and lost in time, becoming more and more unmotivated as the years go on, eventually living in homelessness before becoming a sort of villain. Not the best track record for even an alum of the Avengers. But I can't totally rag on him. The Avengers have insanely high standards and some people just want to hang out and eat sub sandwiches. So that's D-Man. The number one spot on this list goes to Dr. Druid. Having been trained under the same mentor who trained Doctor Strange, you'd think this guy would have gone on to be a great member of the Avengers. Well, at first he wasn't actually known as such a bad hero by his own right, but after joining the team, it becomes pretty obvious that he wasn't destined for greatness. His attitude is arrogant, he carries a lot of insecurity about living in Strange's shadow for so long, and he also has a big weakness to the charm of women, proving him to have a pretty low emotional intelligence. And this is a pretty major fault when you're supposed to be an Avenger because you need to be able to have a strong character regardless of whatever your power set is. This also tends to lead him to be a subordinate to women in positions of power like Captain Marvel who he continually undermines until his disloyalty leads to her being seriously injured in battle. He then tries to convince everyone to name him the successor as the new chairman. This guy, Dr. Druid, was just kind of a weak-minded fool who was conniving and subordinate through and through. It's surprising he was ever brought on board with the Avengers because he really proves himself to be one of their weakest links while he's there. Number 10, he gives up fighting the Hulk to let him sick the Illuminati. One of the Hulk's most awesome and powerful moments came in the World War Hulk story, when the Incredible Hulk gathered up his warbound on Sakaar and headed to Earth for some much desired revenge on the Illuminati. The Illuminati had tricked Hulk, banished him into space, left him stranded on a world where he was forced to become a gladiator and work his way to become king, and then the ship they sent him there on self-destructed and caused the passing of tons of people he cared about. So yes, the Illuminati deserved what was coming to them, but they still tried to put up a fight. When Hulk arrived on Earth more mad than he has ever been, there were only two people who ever had a chance of bringing him down. The first was the incredibly powerful Sentry, and the second was Ghost Rider. When Ghost Rider showed up and started fighting, the Hulk decided to try and squash him like a bug, quote unquote. Only problem was, now that he had knocked out Johnny Blaze, Zarathos was allowed to take a bit more control, and he attacked back with so much help. Hellfire, the two got to an almost stalemate. The not so bad thing that we're talking about though is when Zarathos, who only punishes the guilty, sees that Hulk is truly innocent in this situation. So he betrays the Illuminati and basically allows the Hulk to go ahead with his destruction. Honestly, Kind of awesome, I wasn't even upset. Let's find some better examples. But before I do that, do you like anime as well as comics? Well, luckily for you, now we have a full channel completely dedicated to nerdy videos about specifically anime and manga. 
Go check out Amazing Top 10 Anime. Let's just move on. Number 9, Johnny Blaze and Danny Ketch. Yet again, I can't really say I blame Johnny Blaze all too much for this one, but still. When Danny Ketch became a new Ghost Rider after Johnny had imprisoned Zarathos in an amulet, Johnny was more than a little suspicious. Johnny Blaze traveled from the west coast to confront this new Ghost Rider, thinking that Zarathos had returned somehow. Blaze hunted down Danny Ketch Ghost Rider and tried to take his life multiple times while Ghost Rider kept attempting to escape Blaze and bring the villain Blackout, who was dispatching multiple people, to justice. Johnny kept this up until he finally watched Ghost Rider save a child in Central Park. This finally made him become less suspicious of Ghost Rider and he stopped trying to take him out repeatedly. He instead decided to observe Daniel to make sure that he wasn't Zarathos and he taught Daniel how to fight and protect himself when he wasn't transformed into Ghost Rider. So ultimately he made up for it but still a little impulsive with the old d lifing there, Johnny. I want to tone that down. Number 8. Alejandro Jones, Hellfire Exploded a Country. Alright, buckle up because this one involves Adam. Not me, like the biblical Adam. In Marvel Comics, Adam has devoted himself to one day eradicating sin from mankind, at any cost, even human souls. To that end, Adam took in orphan children and trained them within a Nicaraguan temple to make them perfect as hosts of the Ghost Rider. Now, with the Fear Itself event and the arrival of the Serpent, Adam decided this was a sign to make his move and offered to free Johnny Blaze from the Ghost Rider. Adam awakened the Seeker and had him pick the new Ghost Rider among those students that he was training. Alejandro Jones was the one chosen and was immediately sent to battle Scotty, who was one of the Serpent's avatars. Now when she came back, Adam demanded that she destroy the sin in the other orphans, which would leave them as husks. She obviously refused, but in return, Adam enslaved her. Now Johnny Blaze, realizing he made a boo-boo, journeyed to Nicaragua to stop them. But Adam turned Alejandro's power into a bomb that went off, taking away the sin from the Nicaraguans, turning them into mindless emotional shells of the individuals they once were. The only ones unaffected by this blast were Johnny and the Seeker. Basically, Alejandro was used to destroy the whole country of Nicaragua. Number 7. Iron Man Joins Kang Yeesh! The Crossing! What a weird crossover event. Every time I think I'm over it, we come up with a list topic where I kind of can't help but like return to it. In this event, Iron Man, one of the main Avengers, was revealed to be secretly one of the baddest of the bad as we learned that Iron Man had actually been working for Kang, or rather, Kang's Immortus version, for years. That's right, it turns out that Iron Man is actually a sleeper agent for Kang, or he was. He kind of still is, because he kind of got reconciled into one being, but it's still the old Iron Man. Anyways, as weird as it sounds, this was actually an even worse weirdness than Captain America working for Hydra in my mind. At least that made more sense to me. Iron Man would fight against the Avengers, and when they struggled to defeat him, they called in a past version of himself for him to beat and uh, almost kill. Number 6. Killing Starseed There was a time in the 70s when Johnny Blaze Ghost Rider joined up with the team known as the Legion of Monsters. While not entirely bad, some of the characters here were monsters and they did indeed give in to their monster tendencies. One such moment would come in Marvel Premiere number 28 in 1975, when a seemingly peaceful alien from a highly advanced race came and plopped a mountain down in California. It caused a bunch of earthquakes which attracted the monster legion, and thanks to Morbius and Werewolf by Night who gave in to their hunger, they attacked the alien. Now admittedly the Ghost Rider tried to intervene, but they still as a group caused the passing of Starseed and he even helped them to get back their non-monstrous forms. So it was kind of rude. Number 5. Actually killed innocents. Other than Jamie, who Wolverine seemingly almost had killed but then ultimately did not have killed, and the countless other baddies that Wolverine has faced and defeated over the years, there are also other youngsters that Wolverine has been forced to take down. One of the worst moments where Wolverine has been forced to eliminate a youth happens actually outside of the main continuity in the Ultimate Universe, the reality of Earth 1610. Here Wolverine is sent on a mission to do the X-Men's dirty work by taking out a young mutant who threatens the very rights mutants are based fighting for. The sad part? It really isn't this kid's fault. His mutant power simply manifested without him knowing and caused him to accidentally vaporize the entire residents of his town, including seemingly his high school crush or his girlfriend or sweetheart and his parents. So it really feels pretty bad and you're like, wow, Wolverine, really, wow, that's what you're doing? But he's like, hey, I gotta protect the mutants or something by killing a mutant. 
or something. Seems a little shady, the reasoning there. Number four, power obsessed. Ghost Rider Danny Ketch was an interesting one for sure. His spirit of vengeance happened to actually be an ancestor of both him and Johnny Blaze named Noble Kale, who became a spirit of vengeance. In Danny Ketch Ghost Rider number two, Danny gets the spirit exercised from him, but instead of doing him good, he went a little bonkers, craving the spirit's power like some kind of addiction. He tried to set himself on fire in Times Square to get the power back. That's how crazy he went. He ended up hanging out in bars, fighting other people just for fun. Yeah, sounds like a blast. But in a turn of events, he was fed doses of the Ghost Rider power, feeding his addiction. Then he began hunting down the other Ghost Riders and Verminous Rex, taking him down and absorbing a whole bunch of Ghost Rider souls and quote unquote overdosing on the power. The Archangel Zadkiel intervened and saved him, but made Danny one of his knights, hunting down other spirits of vengeance, which led him after Johnny Blaze and saw Danny convince a young man, Lucas Collier, to end his own life. So yeah, he's kind of absolutely horrible. Number three, Avengers Disassembled. Avengers Disassembled was a story arc where the Avengers essentially imploded. What had really happened was Wanda had learned of the secret being kept from her, that she'd had fake children, which she'd in essence kind of made, who had been taken from her and then wiped from her mind by Agatha Harkness. Now, Wanda didn't like that too much, and in essence, turned against Agatha, killing her before turning on her friends and colleagues, causing them to lose control, attack one another, and sicking reality warped versions basically of like Vision and dead Avengers on them. Not only did the Avengers hurt one another, but they were made to do so by one of their own, and likely were even somewhat responsible for Wanda getting to a point where she decided to turn on them. So really, who's to blame here? Is it Wanda or is it the Avengers? Or is it kind of everybody? Number two, Johnny hires Cosmic Ghost Rider. In an alternate future when Thanos was attacking the Earth and going on his mad conquest, Frank Castle was killed and sent to hell. While down there, he made a deal with Mephisto to gain the spirit of vengeance and defeat Thanos. Only problem is, when he came back, he was too late and Thanos had taken the lives of everyone on Earth. So he roamed the Earth totally alone and it drove him insane. Castle made a deal with Galactus to gain the power Cosmic in exchange for the Earth. So now, it's Frank Castle with the Spirit of Vengeance and the Power Cosmic. Yes, it is as cool as it sounds, but him going bonkers has made things much more interesting. Unfortunately, he actually goes on to sort of join Thanos in his quest. A lot of stuff happens with the baby and adult Thanos, but basically, in Earth 616, Johnny Blaze is the King of Hell, forces this cosmic Ghost Rider to attack the Avengers in Avengers Volume 8, number 24, and forces Robbie Reyes into a race for Robbie's power, threatening the life of Robbie's brother Gabe. So yeah, this is Johnny being a jerk again, hiring an insanely powerful cosmic ghost rider to de-life the Avengers. Luckily, it doesn't turn out that way. And in at number one is Cosmic Ghost Rider. But the question is, why would Johnny Blaze make Cosmic Ghost Rider go after the Avengers? And what's so wrong with that? Well, you see, Cosmic Ghost Rider in his quest against Thanos actually joined up with Thanos, like I said before. And then he went back in time to try and raise a baby Thanos to be a better Mad Titan, as in, like less death obsessed. This brought him into direct conflict with an alternate Guardians of the Galaxy led by Cable. Now when the fight finally starts, Cosmic Ghost Rider is trying to shield baby Thanos from the violence. So he hands the baby over to Watu the Watcher and starts going to town on these Guardians. The only problem is Cable keeps using his time traveling abilities to bring back more and more heroes to take on this Cosmic Ghost Rider. By my counting, the insane Frank Castle Cosmic Ghost Rider took the lives of about 14 one different time displaced super powered beings. And when he was finally overwhelmed, he had failed completely because he was saved by the baby Thanos who took out the remaining heroes. And then a Punisher dressed Thanos from the future shows up calling Frank dad. I don't know, it's cr it's just, it's, it's, it's insane. Just, just go read it. Number 10, Civil War 1. Oh boy, the first Civil War caused a great uproar and a good deal of problems in the superhero community. It also made Earth vulnerable to attack as it evidently involved just infighting. When superheroes turn on each other, that's bad. When two main superheroes who are part of the same team turn on each other, that's ridiculous. And that's exactly what happened with Civil War 1. While the inciting incident that divided heroes wasn't caused by Iron Man or Captain America, and actually was pretty serious, they both had become leaders of two different approaches for how to best resolve that main issue. Iron Man believed that superhuman beings needed a shorter and tighter leash basically, and should work with the government so they could kind of be overseen. Number 9. Axis. 
Axis was an event where we saw heroes and villains sort of do kind of like a role reversal. This happened as a result of a spell backfiring, cast by, well, you probably guessed it, none other than Scarlet Witch. Wanda, for being a powerful magic user, has kind of a challenging time with magic. Although, to be fair, she actually wasn't the only caster involved here, although she is the one that we often talk about. Doctor Strange started casting with her, and when he got taken out, Doctor Doom actually helped in his stead. So Doom is also possibly to blame as well, even though Wanda usually takes a lot of the flack for this one. What launched the Axis event was Wanda and Doom attempting to cast this spell on the evolved and supremely powerful version of Red Skull, Red Onslaught, which sort of came about when Magneto was like, I know how to fix this, so I'll kill you, and then Red Onslaught happened, so it didn't work out so great. The spell actually succeeded, but kind of backfired in that many other heroes and villains within a certain radius also got hit with the spell unintentionally. Oops. And friends, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, may I recommend that you check out our latest channel, Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Number 8, Hydra Cap. Hydra Cap is definitely a pretty bad thing that happened for the Avengers in, well, in many regards. One, Hydra Captain America is literally another version of Captain America who for a while we actually thought was the main continuity version for real. So. We're not off to a great start with that. Number two, the Avengers failed to stop Hydra Supreme Cap from taking over the US. Number three, some of the Avengers were even manipulated into joining Hydra and Hydra Cap's forces. Some of them were actually like possessed and some of them were just kind of made to do so. All around, it was just a rough time and not a great look for the Avengers overall. I'm actually surprised there isn't more pushback from the public today as a result of this one. Number seven, Iron Man joins Kang. Yeesh, the crossing. What a weird crossover event. Every time I think I'm over it, we come up with a list topic where I kind of can't help but like return to it. In this event, Iron Man, one of the main Avengers, was revealed to be secretly one of the baddest of the bad as we learned that Iron Man had actually been working for Kang, or rather, Kang's Immortus version, for years. That's right, it turns out that Iron Man is actually a sleeper agent for Kang, or he was. He kind of still is, because he kind of got reconciled into one being, but it's still the old Iron Man. Anyways, as weird as it sounds, this was actually an even worse weirdness than Captain America working for Hydra in my mind. At least that made more sense to me. Iron Man would fight against the Avengers, and when they struggled to defeat him, they called in a past version of himself for him to beat and uh, almost kill. Number six, final fight. When the Earth was threatened by incursions during the events of Time Runs Out, what did the Avengers do? Save the day? Try to stop those incursions? Not Exactly. Captain America had once been a member of the Illuminati, the secret group of heroes who banded together to resolve ideally all of Earth's problems without anyone actually even knowing. A group of super powered intellectual, philosophical and moral geniuses. At least. That's what they thought. When the incursions were discovered to be a threat, and the majority of the group felt that it was important to consider the possibility that they'd maybe need to destroy other worlds to sort of save themselves from it, Captain America fought vehemently against that idea. As such, his mind was wiped and he was decidedly ejected from the group. When he regained his memories, rather than use the Avengers to fight against the incursions and find a way to stop them, he actually spent the last bit of time before the multiverse was to end hunting down the Illuminati and in a toe to toe battle with Iron Man. Number five, create the Illuminati. Sometimes it only takes one Avenger to mess up everything for all of us. And that's kind of what happened when Tony Stark, aka Iron Man of the Avengers, decided to bring together the secret superhero group known as the Illuminati. Like I said, this wasn't the combined effort of the Avengers, but when you think about the Avengers now and even before, Tony has been a staple of that team for a very long time. And the Illuminati was really his genius idea. His genius idea. Idea. The Illuminati as a group have definitely caused more trouble than they're worth, causing a lot more problems in the cosmos than they've actually solved. Playing a key role in the end of the multiverse during Time Runs Out when they couldn't save the world, helping to cause Secret Invasion and World War Hulk as well. So, yeah. Number four, Civil War II. Even worse by far than Civil War 1 was its follow up, Civil War 2. In this story, we got more infighting, but for less logical reasons. This time, it was Iron Man versus Captain Marvel, because I guess Iron Man just really needs to like duke it out with all the captains. This one is one we can also likely more blame on the behind the scenes, as Marvel was definitely aiming to capitalize on Civil War 1's success with this follow up, but it just didn't work out too well because Civil War 2 didn't really make a lot of sense for most readers. 
years. But in terms of the canon, Carol, I think, was hands down to blame here for just being, well, unreasonably aggressive on the matter that was up for debate. Whether or not to let in human Ulysses, a precog, predict the future and then, based on those predictions, stop future criminals from committing future crimes before, of course, they even happen. Yeah, and I say that as a Captain Marvel fan. I'm a big Carol Danvers fan, but this one was pretty one sided in my mind. Even I am like, I think Carol was wrong and Tony was right. And I don't say that very often. Number three, Avengers Disassembled. Avengers Disassembled was a story arc where the Avengers essentially imploded. What had really happened was Wanda had learned of the secret being kept from her, that she'd had fake children, which she'd in essence kind of made, who had been taken from her and then wiped from her mind by Agatha Harkness. Now, Wanda didn't like that too much, and in essence, turned against Agatha, killing her before turning on her friends and colleagues, causing them to lose control, attack one another, and sicking reality warped versions basically of like Vision and dead Avengers on them. Not only did the Avengers hurt one another, but they were made to do so by one of their own, and likely were even somewhat responsible for Wanda getting to a point where she decided to turn on them. So really, who's to blame here? Is it Wanda or is it the Avengers? Or is it kind of everybody? Number two, ignoring Scarlet Witch. Avengers Disassembled was bad, but likely what was worse was that it kind of could all have been avoided if the rest of the team had simply, I don't know, cared more about their teammate and friend, Wanda. Scarlet Witch had a lot happen to her, and although this is, of course, superhero comics where every day that you're alive there's a threat of trauma or, you know, of the world ending or both, there had been many signs that Wanda was not in a good place. Rather than do something about it or, you know, attempt to, I don't know, get her help. Mainly the Avengers just went on as though everything was fine. I mean, I know they all each have a lot individually going on, but come on guys. If you have someone with reality warping powers on your team and they are using those powers to create fake children, which then disappear without a trace after they also lose their life partner thanks to them basically being taken apart, mind wiped, and rebuilt as a blank slate without emotion, you might think to offer them some help or, you know, at least check in to see like if they need anything, if they need a hug or a a conversation. I'm not blaming them for what Wanda did, but I would at least like to hold them accountable for being pretty much awful friends to her in her time of need. Number one, no more mutants. Probably one of the worst things that at least one of the Avengers did was to threaten all of the mutant kind's existence with just, you know, a few words. Although admittedly, this wasn't so much Wanda's fault as it was Marvel's, who of course needed some reason to get rid of mutants for a bit because, you know, they'd sold the rights away and they weren't really profiting as much from comics involving mutants at that time, and they simply had too many of them. But reasoning behind the story aside, during House of M, Wanda in the end struck out at all mutants because her father, she felt, was more obsessed with fighting for mutant rights than he was with his actual own flesh and blood family. Although we'd later learn that Scarlet Witch and her brother Quicksilver weren't even really like flesh and blood family. To begin with, part of the reason that Wanda suffered the mental break, which caused House of M and later M Day, had to do with the fact that her friends and Avengers didn't seem to notice or perhaps care that Wanda was suffering as a result of losing her children. And in fact, let us not forget that Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, of the Avengers was also the one who even kind of like caused Wanda to remember her kids to begin with. She kind of spilled those beans. So whose fault was M Day really in the end? It was still Wanda's. Wanda was the one that said the words, so it's still her fault. But. Janet was there. Number 10, kills. One of the worst things about Wolverine in general, but also maybe one of the best things, is that he kills. Or more now that he's willing to kill, I guess. Although back in the day, he really did kill pretty indiscriminately. And like I said, it was basically what made him one of the worst, while also being the best at what he does. Although as Wolverine has even said himself, what he does isn't usually very nice. Now Wolverine is more reserved to maiming those he comes up against, only really killing those who he feels really deserve it who are beyond redemption. But even then, the fact that Wolverine thinks he gets to decide those folks' fate could be seen as, well, pretty problematic. I mean, Wolverine's a pretty good dude all around, but I still don't think, even as a hero, that he should get the judgment call on who lives and who dies. You know what I mean? It definitely makes him a way more complex and interesting character. I will say that, so it is good in that way. Number nine, almost killed an innocent. During his first long running Wolverine series, Wolverine at one point must face off against Lady Deathstrike. The first time around that this happens in the series is back in the past, after Wolverine has seemingly traveled back in time via a picture. It makes a lot more sense if you read the story, but it's 
basically what happens. While attempting to escape Lady Deathstrike and defeat the German World War II soldiers who have infiltrated the part of Spain Wolverine is in, he and the rebels are faced with the decision of what to do with a young prisoner who has seen too much and could cause them to be captured if he's forced to talk. Prisoner's name is Jamie, by the way. I didn't write that down, but I know that, just in case you're wondering. One of the options on the table is to simply take out the prisoner, Jamie, but because of his age, Wolverine ultimately helps to let the boy go and set him free. However, for a small moment there, it is implied that Wolverine has basically made the other choice and decided to kill the prisoner rather than let him walk free with a promise that he won't tell anyone what he has seen or heard about where the rebels are headed. It's a very shocking moment where you're like, wait, did that just happen? Don't worry, it didn't happen. Oh, it only almost happened. The notion was entertained and that I think is still pretty bad. Number 8. Relationship with Squirrel Girl Wolverine's relationship with Squirrel Girl, as was established in New Avengers, might be considered by some to be one of the worst things he's ever done, or that was ever done to him as a character I guess. This is likely because Squirrel Girl aka Doreen Green is often depicted as being from a different generation entirely than Wolverine. And that's not even considering that he's actually even older than he appears and then the generation that he first appeared in. Squirrel Girl and Wolverine were implied to have had a romantic relationship in the 2010 New Avengers series in issue number 7, and many consider it to be pretty odd. And I gotta say, the way it's also kind of weirdly like shoehorned in there, you're like, what? Why? Why is this in here? What purpose? Narratively, does this really give us? And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists about Wolverine, then be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Goodness knows, he's done a lot of bad things. Even Wolverine would say that though. He'd be like, I got a lot of things in my closet. I got a lot of skeletons in my closet, bub. Number seven, beat up Angel. So back in the Avengers Volume 1, issue number 214, Johnny Blaze and the Avengers come into conflict. Johnny was hanging out on some rocks in New Mexico, brooding and hating on the world for everyone who abandons him. When all of a sudden, Warren Worthington III comes zooming down the road in a Ferrari with a girl in the passenger seat. Johnny seems to get really, really jealous and decides to scare the hell out of the couple, causing Warren to crash the car. Johnny then challenges Warren to a race. Now to be fair, Warren gets a good punch in on Johnny, but that just makes the Ghost Rider use his Hellfire to burn Warren's soul and put him into a coma. Kind of really overdoing it there, ghosty. Thor, Tigra, Iron Man, and Captain America head to the area of the incident to take on the Ghost Rider, only for him to give them much more of a fight than they probably expected. Number six. Got even with the Punisher. So the Punisher has done some pretty heinous things to Wolverine over the years in their ongoing fight for who can be the most edgy. This has less to do with Wolverine and Punisher feuding within the comics and more to do with shots being fired between a few of their passionate writers, Wolverine's Frank Thierry and Punisher's Garth Ennis. Now granted, Thierry has also written a few Punisher titles in his time, although I don't think Ennis has ever written a Wolverine titled book, at least not as far as I know, which is surprising to me. But I Anyways, I digress. In Terry's 2003 issue of Wolverine, issue 186, Terry ended up aiming to get revenge on the Punisher for what Garth Ennis had him do in 2002 during his Marvel Knights run on Punisher in issue number 17. Ennis had Punisher brutally attack and maim Wolverine basically, even going so far as to steamroll him and some other things, which I don't know if I can even say on YouTube, but they were bad. To get revenge, Terry had Wolverine imply the Punisher was gay. Doesn't sound so bad until you read it and you see how how it's presented, with Logan implying the Punisher is basically lesser or less of a man or a hero because of his possible sexual orientation. Yikes. Maybe don't do that. Maybe don't write that. It's unfortunate because now that's also on Wolverine as a character. Yeesh. Number 5. Create the Illuminati Sometimes it only takes one Avenger to mess up everything for all of us. And that's kind of what happened when Tony Stark, aka Iron Man of the Avengers, decided to bring together the secret superhero group known as the Illuminati. Like I said, this wasn't the combined effort of the Avengers, but when you think about the Avengers now and even before, Tony has been a staple of that team for a very long time. And the Illuminati was really his genius idea. His genius idea. The Illuminati as a group have definitely caused more trouble than they're worth, causing a lot more problems in the cosmos than they've actually solved. Playing a key role in the end of the multiverse during Time Runs Out when they couldn't save the world, helping to cause Secret Invasion and World War Hulk as well. So, 
Yeah. Number four became Apocalypse. Of course, this one also did not happen in the main continuity, but hey, it still happened, so it still counts. This all went down in Age of Apocalypse, where Wolverine, here known as Weapon X, would fight against Apocalypse for most of his life. At one point, he was part of Magneto's X Men, but would leave them to rescue Jean Grey, his love, and later his wife, and fight alongside her against Apocalypse in their own way. Eventually, however, Jean was believed to have been killed, and Weapon X would become a recluse, only to find out years later. Later, that she was actually alive. Dun dun dun. When the Celestials returned to Earth following the death of Apocalypse, James Howlett offered himself to the Celestials in order to prevent the destruction of Earth. However, this caused him to become the very villain he had hated the most, as the Celestials used tech to modify him, giving him great power, but basically warping his mind and causing him to become Apocalypse's heir, known as Weapon Omega. He was basically just like, evolution is what it's all about, baby. We were like, but don't you see? You're Apocalypse now. And he's like, but it's different. I'm trying to save people by killing people. Wait a minute, maybe you're right. <laughs> Number three, throwing his brother off a bridge. Speaking of Danny Ketch, he is actually the brother of Johnny Blaze. In the beginning of Ghost Rider Volume 9, Johnny Blaze was the king of hell. Something that happened in Damnation after Johnny's soul was sent to hell and he convinced Zarathos to help him in a journey to usurp Mephisto's throne. Either way, Johnny Blaze began capturing demons roaming the earth. He tried to recruit the help of his brother, Danny, but Ketch refused and tried to convince Johnny that his position as the king of hell was corrupting his soul. Blaze didn't seem to like that too much, and so he very unceremoniously stripped Ketch of his spirit of vengeance and threw him off the Manhattan Bridge. Nothing like stealing your brother's power and throwing him off a bridge, am I right? Luckily though, for Danny, he got saved from drowning by caretaker Sarah. But this is like the fourth time Johnny has just gone way overboard, or over bridge. I'm just gonna stop. Stuff. Number two, made moves on MJ. So this one is so awful, it of course cannot come from the main canon of Earth 616. Instead, this point comes to us from the alternate reality of Earth 1610, also known as the Ultimate Universe. After Wolverine had she attempted to get back at him by making him telepathically swap bodies with the person he hated the most, which ended up being Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man. Although Jean later says, oh sorry, I didn't know this would happen to you, Peter. Oops. <laughs> but anyways. While swapped, both heroes struggle to deal with the everyday while occupying each other's bodies. However, Wolverine still manages to find some time to put some moves on MJ. Well, they don't seal the deal. This is really messed up because Mary Jane at this point in time is a teenager and she didn't even know that Peter and Logan had swapped body so she thought that it was just Peter looking for some action instead of the super old at this point thanks to his healing factor X-Men hero Wolverine. Although not a very heroic moment here Wolverine. What you doing? Don't do that. Number one, kill Dokken. I think one of the worst things you can do as a parent is to kill those you're supposed to be looking out for and taking care of and protecting. Even if your son happens to be the often villainous Dokken. Now commonly referred to by his actual birth slash human name Akihiro. At one point Wolverine was forced to put down Akihiro during a fight. Akihiro had held a grudge against his old man for years, having been trained by Romulus to hate Logan after being stolen from his mother's womb and raised by Romulus. For years, Wolverine thought his son was dead, not knowing to come searching for Akihiro. But Akihiro was raised to believe he was basically abandoned, and he also grew up in a household where people didn't like him because he was half Japanese and half Canadian, so that was another issue. Thanks to some plotting from the devious and diabolical mind of Victor Creed, aka Wolverine's nemesis Sabretooth, Wolverine was forced into a death match with Dokken, a match that ended with Wolverine killing Akihiro, drowning him in a puddle, while sadly thinking of what could have been had Akihiro been given a chance at a semi-normal life, being raised by Wolverine and of course his now deceased mother Itsu. What would it have been like if their life had been happy? We'll never know because he gets drowned in a puddle. But don't worry, Akihiro is alive and well now so it all fixed itself. And now he and Wolverine are on great terms so never mind, I guess.